You're listening to the Finchwood Discipleship Podcast. My name is Matthew, and as your host, my mission is to help you discover who God is and what it means to live as a citizen of His kingdom. Greetings, Finchwood listeners. It's been three weeks and not the usual two since I last spoke to you, and that's because I mistakenly released the previous episode a week early. I doubt that anyone was bothered by that, but if it caused any confusion, then I do apologize. Also, before we get started today, I'd like to ask for your help. I'm trying to increase the listenership of this podcast, so please tell your friends about it. Speaking of which, if you're with us for the first time, I'd like to welcome you to the Finchwood Discipleship Podcast. We're in the middle of our third season, and the theme of this season is that it is a practical how-to guide to the Christian lifestyle. In this episode, we're going to look at the two extreme ends of a spectrum, fasting versus feasting. More broadly, we could describe that as denying ourselves on the one hand and allowing ourselves to enjoy God's generosity on the other hand. It's important to experience both times of celebration and times of self-discipline without going off the rails into either torturing ourselves with extreme asceticism or gorging ourselves on hedonistic pleasures. The goal here, just like it is with so many aspects of the Christian life, is to balance these two extremes, enjoying God in gratitude, while also participating in the transformational work that He wants to do in our hearts. Simply put, in case anyone is completely unfamiliar with this term, fasting is broadly defined as voluntarily turning down something good most commonly food, for a period of time in order to gain some greater benefit. That benefit is usually something spiritual, although there are documented physical benefits that can come from self-denial. And while I'm not going to get too far into that in this episode because I'm not a doctor and we're talking about spiritual benefits here, a simple web search will tell you all sorts of diseases and disorders that fasting can help to alleviate. Just do me a favor and don't believe every bit of medical advice that you read on the internet. The bottom line is that this is good for you, and I think that's because God designed our bodies and our souls to work in harmony. Fasting is a very ancient practice that's found in one form or another in almost every human culture. Name a world religion and I can pretty much guarantee you that they have something to say about this topic and the odds are that they also have a calendar that says which days they eat food on and which days they restrict their diets in this way or that. Within our own tradition in the Bible, we see first of all that fasting was a regular part of the life of God's people in the centuries before Christ. The law of Moses commands the children of Israel to fast on Yom Kippur, which is their day of atonement. And we also see people like David and Daniel participating in additional voluntary fasts for various reasons throughout the narrative. Moving forward into the New Testament, we hear Jesus teach his followers that when they fast, and notice he didn't say if they fast, they should do it in a particular way. With that being said, I should mention that there's no explicit command in the New Testament that says Christians are required to fast. In other words, this isn't quite a thou shalt do this kind of thing, so much as it's a recommended practice. Still, throughout the centuries since the time of Jesus, fasting has always been a normal part of what it means to follow him. That is, of course, except for modern, particularly American Christianity. Most of us are relatively unwilling to go without our creature comforts for very long, and so fasting is something that we don't really do much. And then when we do talk about it, we tend to frame it as an extreme sacrifice or as this unreasonably heavy burden, something that people only do if they're legalists or extremists. And yes, fasting is something that it is very possible to do to an unreasonable extent. And it can be difficult, but it can also be incredibly rewarding if we go into it with the right expectations and with a little bit of wisdom that we can pick up from previous generations of Christians who were much more familiar with this part of the road toward God. Just like I've done in so many other episodes this season, this one is going to start out with a quick look at the what and the why questions. But this time, we'll end up answering more in the negative than the positive, because there are a lot of common misunderstandings surrounding this topic, 
we're going to identify some wrong motives for fasting, as well as several situations that seem like fasting, but are actually something different. Then, with those out of the way, we're going to take a really broad look at what fasting can be, taking it out of the religious box that so many people tend to put it in. And then hopefully what we'll come up with in the end is a balanced, healthy look at how to incorporate both fasting and feasting into your lifestyle and your walk with God in a way that actually helps you grow spiritually as opposed to just letting this become yet another spiritual practice for you to feel bad about because you're not participating in it. Let's start by getting a few things out of the way that don't really fit within the scope of this conversation. First of all, I need to draw a boundary here between fasting for spiritual purposes versus calorie restriction for the purposes of losing weight. Part of this is just basic dieting, and even the term intermittent fasting does play a part in that set of conversations. The thing is that you certainly can do this, and like I said a few minutes ago, there are some health benefits that can be obtained by either not eating for a set period of time or by restricting what we eat. The distinction I'm trying to draw isn't to say that you can't do both that and fast for spiritual reasons. You may even be able to do both at the same time, but it's important to recognize that they're not quite the same. Motives are very important here because when it's done right, fasting becomes a form of worship. It's a sacrifice that you choose voluntarily to express your desire for something greater and better than food or whatever else you may decide to give up. Another caveat here is that selectively giving up things that you don't want anyway isn't fasting. It's just being picky. I'm reminded here of a co-worker at an old job that I had years ago who was Roman Catholic, and every year she would say that she had given up smoking for Lent. The thing is that I asked her about it, and she said she couldn't stand even the smell of cigarettes. She didn't smoke, even if it wasn't Lent. This wasn't a sacrifice so much as it was a healthy life choice that she was trying to pass off as a gift she was giving to God. And the same principle applies for our spiritual health. If the Spirit of God is telling you not to do something, then giving up that activity, that substance, that relationship is no longer a matter of voluntary sacrifice. Fasting means going a step further than what's commanded, because that's where true worship begins. I'm reminded of something that's written in the book of Hebrews. The author of this letter uses the same analogy about running a marathon that I tend to use a lot in this podcast. In the 12th chapter of that book, they encourage their readers to, and I quote, throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. What's easy to miss in this verse is that it treats sin and the things that weigh us down as two different categories. When we fast, what we're giving up is in that other category, the distractions, the stuff we don't really need, the parts of our lives that may even be good, but they might be keeping us from something better. Moving on, it also doesn't really count as fasting to give up something you can't have. Fasting is a voluntary act. The moment it becomes mandatory or necessary or unavoidable, it becomes something else, and some of those situations are things we've talked about before or will talk about in the future. They're just not what we're talking about this time. What we are talking about, what does legitimately count as fasting, is voluntarily giving up pretty much any good thing for a set period of time. The best and most common example of this, as I said earlier, is food. For example, you could decide that you're not going to eat dessert for a month or that you don't eat food at all on Tuesdays until further notice. Or you could decide that for the next six weeks, you're only going to live on bread and water. But beyond food, you really could fast from anything that isn't inherently sinful. I know people who start every new year fasting from TV and social media, once again not because those things are somehow evil in and of themselves, but because they want to get closer to God in the process. And by the way, whatever it is that you fast, it's a great idea to use that time you would have spent eating or scrolling or in whatever other activity to pray or to worship God instead. But even that isn't strictly a requirement. It's also more of a good suggestion. 
The thing is that there are no actual biblical guidelines for how to do this the correct way. A lot of Christian denominations fill in that blank by setting up specific times and seasons and guidelines for how they fast together as a community. The most recognizable example for most people would be Lent, the season right before Easter, when a lot of Christians give something up, and some groups even have a prescribed set of dietary restrictions that their members are expected to follow during that time period. And all of that is fine and good, but I just have to let you know that it's not strictly mandatory for Christians, since it's not commanded in the Bible. What the Bible does give us is several examples of people fasting, and there are some things we can learn from them. One commonly cited story is found in Daniel chapter 1, where Daniel and three of his friends had been taken as prisoners of war, and they were being forced to assimilate into the culture of the Babylonian Empire. Rather than eating the local foods that didn't conform to the dietary guidelines that Moses had given them, they made the decision to live off of only vegetables. There are a lot of people today who read that chapter and conclude that this is some special God-ordained formula, and they make all these specific rules about what you can and can't eat on what they call a Daniel fast. If you choose to participate in one of those, that's also perfectly fine. Just be aware that there's no official definition of that term in the Bible. In fact, there's nothing in that story to even say that we're supposed to follow the example of those four young men, at least in terms of what they did and didn't eat. Another interesting example of fasting in the Bible is what's called the Nazarite Oath. Now, the guidelines for this are found in the book of Numbers chapter 6, and three or four people in the Bible are described as having subjected themselves to these restrictions whether for a short time or even permanently as a form of lifelong fasting. Now, what I find interesting about this chapter is that right up front, it says this is a suggestion. In the middle of the law of Moses, between all of the thou shalts and the thou shalt nots, all those genuine commands that God's people were expected to obey without variation, we have this one chapter that basically says, if you want to do something extra for God, give this a try. It then lists a few simple food and drink items like alcohol and grapes and vinegar that a person taking this oath could omit from their diets, as well as telling them not to cut their hair and not to come in contact with any dead bodies, which includes visiting a graveyard or even going to a funeral. The idea was to live with inward and outward reminders of being set apart for God, belonging to Him and not to ourselves. Now, becoming a Nazarite, which, by the way, is just a word that means one who abstains, is a pretty weird lifestyle to try and live out in the 21st century. I know because I actually did this back in 2008. For the majority of that year, I did my best to live out what Numbers chapter 6 describes to the letter. Now, maybe God wants us to do these specific things because somehow they're especially meaningful to him. But I'm not sure that's the case. At most, I think there might be some hidden symbolism here, lessons that God wants to teach his people by pondering exactly what he's invited them to abstain from. But beyond that, though, I find this to be a wonderful picture of the heart behind fasting. It's not a commandment. It's something extra. It's something God is inviting us into. It's as if he's saying, yes, I've given you all of these good things and you're perfectly welcome to enjoy them. But you have to make an intentional choice and say no to some of the good things if you want the best. And the best is deeper and closer communion with God himself. So on that note, let's move on and talk about the motives, those spiritual benefits that we hope to gain when we fast. Unfortunately, the why question here is just as prone to faulty beliefs and misunderstandings as the what. There are a lot of unhealthy or unscriptural reasons that people go into fasting, and we also need to get those out of the way so that we can get a much clearer picture of how to do this right. Just like any other form of worship, or any gift for that matter, fasting isn't intended to earn anything. Sometimes people go into a fast hoping to convince God of their devotion, in exchange for some favor that they want or need from him. 
usually a breakthrough in some life circumstance for themselves or for a loved one. Others might fast in hope that God would send revival to their churches or to bring wayward family members back home, or to bring about some political or cultural shift that they think they can convince God to orchestrate. And this isn't how it's supposed to work. In fact, the only person that fasting is supposed to influence is the person doing it. You're never going to make enough sacrifices, however voluntary and profound they might be, to convince God to do your bidding. Remember, like I said several episodes ago in our discussion on prayer, that God already thinks the world of you. So if you need or even just want something, just ask him. But don't try to beg and bargain with God as if he's open for tradesies. He's already actively looking for ways to show us his generosity, and he's not looking for anything in return aside from our adoration and gratitude. So because fasting doesn't earn us anything in God's eyes, it's also not something for us to brag about. That's something Jesus addressed in one of his sermons. He pointed out how the religious elites of his day would walk around with grimaces on their faces so that everyone would know that they were fasting today. Their motivation was wrong because they weren't doing it for spiritual reasons. They were doing it so that they could show off their spirituality to others. Jesus' words to them are frankly sobering and tragic. He said, truly, you have already received your reward in full. In other words, the only benefit you're going to get out of that kind of fast is the admiration of others, but nothing is going on inside of you. Instead, the instructions Jesus gave were that, ideally, no one should even be able to tell that you're fasting. Go about your business as usual because you're not doing this for recognition from others. On the other side of that coin are all the people who fast to try and make up for something they've done wrong. Just like the last group, they think that fasting can improve God's opinion of them, so they punish themselves for their sins in an effort to earn their way back into God's love and somehow make amends for the wrongs they've committed and the mistakes they've made. This is the spiritual equivalent of trying to pick the lock on a door to a room that you're already standing in. Once again, God already loves you. And the great news is that there's nothing you can do to make him love you any more or less. So, fasting to try and make up for your sin isn't going to work. You just have to accept his forgiveness as the free gift that it is. On a similar note, most likely because of the way that God has been taught and presented to us by broken forms of Christianity, a lot of people have this persistent belief deep down in their hearts that God doesn't want to give us good things. And so they deprive themselves because that's what they think will make him happy. This is based on the mistaken notion that Christianity is about destroying one's humanity because being human is somehow evil in God's eyes. While I don't have time in this episode to lay out exactly where that idea comes from, what I can tell you is that it is not at all biblical, and it's not what Jesus actually wants. Yes, we all do have aspects of ourselves. That's the sin and the selfishness that we've talked about in previous episodes. And those are parts of us that God wants to remove from us, and his plan is to replace those bits with his original design for humanity. The difference, though, is that the original design that he wants to replace that sin with was recognizably and intrinsically human. In the beginning, God looked at the human beings he had created, and he called them very good. And I have to tell you, Adam and Eve weren't in the garden saying, wow, I don't need food. No, they were designed as human beings with desires for food and sleep and companionship and comfort and so forth. Those are all very good things that God designed us to want, precisely because they're things that he wants to satisfy us with. And no amount of self-denial is going to change that, nor should it. So with all of that in mind, If God's desire is to bless us with good things, why in the world would he instruct us to occasionally tell ourselves no, to turn down the very good things that God created for our enjoyment and sustenance? Now, the answer to that question, at least from what I see in scripture, is that there's something greater than food, something greater than scrolling Instagram, greater than all those things we talked about earlier that a person could fast from. 
We fast because we want to be more like Jesus. We want to know him and to love him. And part of following him is learning to rely on his strength and goodness instead of our own. And fasting is an incredible way to speed up that transformational process in our hearts. The quick and dirty explanation of how that happens is that fasting knocks out all the crutches and the props and the other comforts that we unknowingly lean on. Fasting humbles us by revealing our weaknesses. Not only does that help us to learn to rely on him in those moments of hangry frustration, but it also actively helps us know what parts of ourselves we still need to surrender to God's leadership. A kind of embarrassing example on my part here is that I once did a speech fast. I endeavored to not talk for three days. And since you're listening to the 31st episode of this podcast, you probably won't be surprised to know that that was a difficult experience for me. By the end of those three days, I was bewildered to realize just how important it is to me to be heard and to be perceived as intelligent by other people. When I chose to remain silent, to let others have the last word, to let them speak and I would just listen, it challenged the part of me that relies on validation from others. I was frankly miserable. But I'd like to think that experience taught me a thing or two about, first of all, listening before speaking and leaving room for God to speak to me. But even beyond that, about where I derive my sense of value from. Is it from the fact that people hear me and think that I'm smart? Or is it because God knows me and I know him in the secret place of my heart in a way that isn't affected by whether I happen to be talking right now? That's the what and the why of fasting from a Christian perspective. So now let's get really practical with the how. Over the years, I've picked up some good advice from others about how to make fasting both as painless and as effective as possible. My first piece of advice is to be specific. If you make a decision to just, quote, eat less junk food or watch less TV sometimes, that's not a very measurable goal. It's hard to know if you're actually doing it, and it's hard to enforce. Those kinds of fasts make it very easy to reinterpret yourself out of actually having to do something hard. I'm not a big fan of the phenomenon in the business world of setting SMART goals, ones that are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound, S-M-A-R-T, But in this conversation, those are actually really useful predictors of whether or not your fast will bear any fruit. You have to be specific, and it has to be achievable. It's good to make sure that you're not aiming too high. I remember one time in high school, I was about 110 pounds soaking wet, and I decided on a whim that I was going to do a 40-day water-only fast for Lent. I hadn't prepared for it, I didn't know what I was doing, And you better believe I broke down before lunch that day. I was at those vending machines between the cafeteria and my third block, buying whatever I could get for the change that was in my pocket that day. Fasting may take some preparation, especially if you're talking about an extended food fast. For a few days before you even go into a fast like that, it's good to eat lighter and cleaner foods than you would normally take, so that you don't have to detox from all the junk and be hungry at the same time. And then when your fast is over, do the same thing backwards. Start with high-fiber foods, and then only gradually shift into heavier foods. Another relatively embarrassing story from my past is that I did a three-day water-only fast in my early 20s, and in my relative youthful ignorance, I decided that the best thing to break it with was going to be a delicious six-ounce block of Vermont sharp cheddar cheese. And I gotta tell you, for the next couple of days after that, I was not having a good time. I'll just leave it at that. It was a poor decision. Along those same lines, you should know that when you go without something that's normally comforting, you're going to be uncomfortable. If you abstain from food, you're going to be hungry. You're going to feel tired. And oddly enough, your breath will smell kind of weird. My advice for you here is to plan around those things to the best of your ability. If you can do fewer stressful things, that's a good idea, especially as both your body and mind get used to the idea that this is something you're going to do on a regular basis. 
If you're looking for some good news here, I can tell you that the worst day of a multi-day fast is usually either the first or second one. After that, your body stops having quite as many sugar cravings, and your body adjusts to the idea that it has to live off of its reserves for a little while. Now, while you're fasting food, it's really important to take care of yourself in other ways. Be sure to drink plenty of water. It's still good to bathe and brush your teeth and all of the other self-care things that you normally do. This helps, first of all, to guard against making a religious show out of your fast, but also it's just plain healthy. And your health is really important here. I don't mean to scare you, but if you push your body too far, you could actually hurt yourself. If you're sick or elderly, or particularly if you are diabetic or pregnant or nursing, you probably should talk to a doctor before making any drastic changes to your diet. Also, I hope this goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway to be perfectly clear. If you have a history of disordered eating, you need to be very careful how you approach fasting. My advice for anyone who is in one of those riskier categories is simple. It's probably best for you to find something else to fast from other than food. Something like social media or listening to music while you drive or even just skipping your morning latte can be a sacrifice of worship that you can offer to God. And all that leads me to that balancing principle that I talked about in the beginning of this episode. Too much fasting is by definition too much, but so is too much feasting and too much celebration. Both of those extremes are mentioned in the Bible, but for what it's worth, the feasting and celebrating are mentioned far more often than fasting is. God wants us to enjoy him. So the goal here is to find a middle ground in which both expressions are a real part of your life, where you gratefully partake of the goodness of God without becoming so dependent on those gifts that he gives us that you stop relying on him as the giver. Usually when we underemphasize fasting, what that reveals in us is that when the rubber actually meets the road, we don't believe that God wants to bless us. And so our instinct, because we were made to experience goodness and blessing, is to milk all of the enjoyment out of life that we can on our own. Ironically, though, an overemphasis on fasting often signals the exact same thing, that we don't expect God to want us to have good things, and that we think we need to somehow convince him through our deprivations and our suffering that we've earned some enjoyment for once. And the problem with that belief is that because it's not based in the reality of who God is, no amount of depriving ourselves is ever going to convince you of the truth that God actually loves you. So many of us Christians, myself included, still tend to fall back into those old ways of thinking. And when you live your life out of either of those internal belief systems, you are going to hurt yourself in the process. Over the years that I've been trying my best to walk with God, I've had to learn the hard way that my personal tendency, my gut reaction in pretty much all things, is to believe that I'm supposed to abstain, that God is saying, no, don't enjoy anything. And to be fair, sometimes he does say no. But he is also a God who loves to say yes. He delights in it. So I have to consciously remind myself that he's good, that he's generous, and that he's far more good and joyful than I have led myself to believe. Some of you listening to this podcast are undoubtedly more like me, and I'm sure some are in the opposite camp where you tend to say yes all the time to the point of chronically lacking self-discipline. For you, fasting may not come very naturally, but that's all the more reason to dive into this ancient practice, because the point is to strike a balance between those two extremes. Because everyone leans toward one extreme or the other, The best practice that I've found is, if you're going to emphasize one, and you most definitely are, then do so while also making a conscious effort to emphasize the other extreme. That way, we have the ability to use fasting, alongside other tools that we have at our disposal, to build each other up and be the best Christians that we can be. It should be one part out of many within a balanced diet of other practices. And that sense of balance, by the way, is something that we'll look at further in the next episode, which will be about managing our time by setting some aside for work and some for resting. I hope you'll join me in that discussion two weeks from now 
Meanwhile, once again, please tell a friend about Finchwood, and as always, thank you so much for listening. You've been listening to the Finchwood Discipleship Podcast, conversations for people who want to be more like Jesus. If you enjoyed this episode, then please subscribe now and consider sharing it with your friends. For more information about this episode's topic, or to continue the discussion, please consult the show notes. See you next time!